Most men prefer blondes, but do most investors prefer bonds? No, no they don't. <laughs> and actually, I like redheads, but that is a slippery slope for the start of the video. I sort of stole that pun from the mighty Peter Lynch of Fidelity fame, who once said, gentlemen who prefer bonds don't know what they're missing. Well, if sex sells, then I'm committing YouTube suicide today and talking about the least sexy of all the asset classes, which surely is bonds. It's funny, isn't it? When the stock market crashes, everyone tells you to buy the dip, but bond markets have had a complete nightmare in 2022, and I don't hear many people telling you to rush out and buy them. But there is something truly remarkable about bonds, and by the end of this video, you'll know the amazing hack that including them in your portfolio can have, and I think might just change the way you think about them forever. Two things are happening right now. Interest rates are going up and stock markets have fallen. Although quite frankly, what on earth stock markets are up to by the time this video goes from scripting to filming to you watching it is anyone's guess, but I bet it's still pretty volatile out there. Honestly, trying to script and film these videos as fast as markets move, the anxiety is real. And what this backdrop creates is an environment where investors start to ponder exactly what they are invested in, and naturally leads to the question, should I move my portfolio into bonds, or at the very least increase the allocation to them? Let's rewind slightly and take a look at exactly what bonds are and how they work. It's basically you loaning out your cash. Who you're loaning it out to depends on who is issuing the bond. It can be a government in the form of government bonds called gilts here in the UK, treasuries in the US, or it can be a company which are known as corporate bonds here. Essentially, you hand over your money on the agreement that you will get it back on a specific day in the future, known as maturity, and you'll get a fixed rate of interest whilst it is loaned out, known as the coupon or the yield. It's no different to you lending Karen next door 50 quid for something. The rate of interest that you'll get all depends on how risky the person that you're lending the money to is on how likely you are to get your money back. Lending money to the UK government is far less risky than lending money to Karen next door, so expect a lower coupon or yield as a result. Coupon seems a bit of a funny word for it now, I know, but it comes from back in the day when actual coupons were clipped from a physical coupon book that was given to bondholders. Bit of history for you. But here's where it gets trickier and it's really easy to start to get lost because bonds are often not held by one person from start to finish. They are actively traded, sold from one person to another, often many times before maturity. And as such, their price fluctuates too. Here's an example. Let's say someone had bought a 10-year corporate bond for £10,000 with a 5% coupon. Now, if I've done anything like the job I hope to in explaining this, you'll now know that you're lending £10,000 to a company and you'll get your money back in 10 years' time and for the privilege, we'll collect 5% a year interest along the way, £500 a year. But instead of holding the bond for the full 10 years, let's say you actually decided to sell it just a few years in for £8,000. Why would you do that? Well, usually one of two reasons. The first reason is when you get worried that the person you've loaned your money out to might not pay you back. You haven't seen Karen for a few weeks and there's some pretty muscly blokes at her door. Your 50 quid's looking a bit ropey. This applies less to government bonds because it's unlikely that governments are going to go bust or do a runner, but companies go bust all the time, so corporate bonds do carry this risk. In this scenario, you might want to ditch your bond before it ditches you and you get no money back, so you decide to sell up and take the hit. The second reason why you might decide to sell up before maturity and take a hit is all about what happens when interest rates are rising, like what is happening right now. New bonds that start to get issued now have higher yields and coupons attached to them to reflect the new higher interest rates that are at play. This makes your bond paying 5% a year less attractive because that's fixed for the full 10 years. You've done your deal, 5% a year, no takesy backsies. As a result, the price of your bond on the open market falls. Why would anybody pay you £10,000 for your bond yielding 5% a year when they could buy a new one off the shelf yielding, say, 7% for the same £10,000? do not forget, however, in this example, you'll only suffer these losses if you actually decide to sell up. If you decide to hold your bond to maturity for the full 10 years, these lower prices potentially in the interim are totally irrelevant. You're getting your £10,000 back at maturity 
maturity unless they've gone bust or run away like Karen. But this highlights another risk, which is a big one right now, and that's inflation. When you get your £10,000 back in 10 years' time, it ain't going to buy you the same amount of stuff that £10,000 does right now. The yield you get along the way is meant to help you with this, but with inflation up as high as, say, 10%, no bond yield is helping you deal with that. I mean, to give you some context here, a 10-year UK government bond at time of filming is yielding about 1.8%. Yeah, nowhere near inflation. I know what you're thinking, this all sounds bloody terrible. Why would I want these things in my portfolio? An asset which, quite frankly, historically, hasn't performed as well as stocks over the long term, which this graph demonstrates here, showing the S&P 500 delivering much higher returns than US bonds in recent years. Well, to be clear, in the interest of balance, bond prices can go up too, for example, in a falling interest rate environment. The example that I've given today is one of falling bond prices because that's what we've seen recently. But the key thing to understand here is that although the coupon attached to the bond is fixed, the price of the bond itself can fluctuate due to a number of factors. The first main reason you should consider them for your portfolio is because they are less volatile than stocks, meaning they don't go up and down in value as much. So if you're looking for a more reliable pair of hands, maybe you've got a lower tolerance to risk generally speaking, or maybe it's because you've got something in mind for the money in the near to medium term and you don't want the valuations fluctuating as much, then bonds might be of interest to you. Maybe you're impending court fees to bring Karen to justice, or maybe you're just retiring soon so you would take comfort from a steadier journey. But to be honest, the main reason that people buy them is because they behave differently, and different is good in a portfolio. And herein lies the amazing trick that buying bonds can have a remarkable impact on your portfolio. If I was Andre Zik, I'd conjure up a card from some orifice right about now. Wow, impressed? I didn't have any playing cards, so uh, it's a beluga whale. <laughs> and now you're wondering, just how long has that been there? Basically, bonds and stocks are negatively correlated, meaning when one goes up, the other goes down. Stocks have fallen over, sending your head in a spin, but your bonds have done quite well, which talks your portfolio off the ledge. Now this doesn't happen all the time, I know what you lot are like in the comments, but it does happen most of the time, and this is where it gets really clever. Let's go back to January 2007, right before the shit is about to hit the fan in stock markets as we enter the financial crash. If you had £10,000 entirely invested in the S&P 500, the 500 or so largest companies in America, by the end of 2009, you'd be down about 16%, £1,600. But instead, if you'd included an allocation to bonds in your portfolio of, let's say, 30%, your losses over that same time period would have only been 5.7%, 570 quid. That's a 65% improvement in returns through only sacrificing 30% of your portfolio for bonds. Even if you'd only had a small amount of bonds, say a 10% allocation, your losses would have been cut down to 12.6%. So a 10% tweak in your portfolio has double the impact on returns here. But perhaps most interestingly, if you'd have had a 50-50 portfolio, so 50% of your money in the S&P 500, 50% in bonds, you'd have actually made a small gain through all this turmoil of 1.2%. So what's happening here? The amazing hack here, and what I think many investors don't fully realise, is that you can sacrifice just a small amount of overall long-term return in exchange for a big reduction in volatility. And it's all down to this negative correlation. Take a look at this from Vanguard. It takes you through different asset allocations between stocks and bonds from 1926 to 2021, so 95 years worth of data. It shows you the average annual return, the best and worst year's results, and how many years these different portfolios made a loss. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can have a good look through this article yourself, but let's just highlight some interesting results here. A 100% stock portfolio delivered an average annual return of 12.3%. Its best year was 54.2% in 1933, and in its worst year it was down 43.1%. Out of 96 years, it posted a negative return in 25 of those, so about 26% of the time. Or another way to look at it, every four years or so. 
What's widely accepted as a traditionally balanced portfolio of 60% stocks, 40% bonds delivered an average annual return of 9.9%. So you sacrifice 2.4% average annual return by including these bonds. But that horrible worst year back in 1931 now only delivered a loss of 26.6%. That's a 16.5% better result, a reduction in volatility of nearly 40% but you only had to sacrifice less than 20% of your return. You also had three less years out of the 96 of negative returns to help calm your nerves. I even hunted round in global markets to see what other examples in different geographies I could find of this working. Take a look at this from Australia. For the 20 years from 2000 to 2020, adding 40% bonds to a portfolio instead of all being in on stocks reduced return by only 0.05% per year, so almost nothing, but reduced volatility from 13.28% to 7.83%. That's over a 40% reduction in volatility for just sacrificing a very small amount of overall return. It also reduced the number of negative years from four to three, so will have made the overall emotional investing journey much easier to stick to. Another thing to consider is that by including bonds in your portfolio can dramatically decrease the amount of time it takes for it to recover after a fall. Coming back closer to home for a moment, if we look at the 2008 crash, the stock markets took around three years to recover in full, whereas a 50-50 portfolio of stocks and bonds took just seven months. Remember, you don't know when a stock market crash is coming, so if you wait until after something happens to diversify, it's probably already too late. And for almost all investors, anything that you can do to help smooth out your journey is probably a good idea, because can I let you in on a little secret? To be a successful investor is... 5% know-how, 95% managing your emotions. It's really easy to sit and look at a graph that shows stocks returning three times the amount of bonds over, say, the last 25-year period, but sitting purely in the stock market for a full 25 years can be easier said than done. Take the last 25 years, for example. You'd have had to stare down the dot-com bubble bursting, the 2008 financial crash, and even more recently, the crash caused by COVID. Sometimes you just have to have an honest word with yourself and ask yourself, are you going to stick this through thick and thin? Or are you gonna do a Karen and fake your own death in a canoe? Remember, this isn't a one or the other argument. I'm not asking you to pick between stocks and bonds. All I'm saying is don't write them off completely. I worry that this huge bull run that we've been on has made many investors lose sight of a balanced portfolio and what that means and why it's important. And as we move into this new time of higher interest rates, lots of talk about bear markets and lower returns for years to come, I think it's important just to revisit some core principles on building a successful investment portfolio. All that being said, if all you care about is total return and you have an iron stomach for the ups and downs, then the stock market is where you want to be. There's nothing wrong with a 100% stocks portfolio if you can cope with the ride. What's this? Just read it. Oh, Christ. Tom would like to issue a formal apology to anyone called Karen that may have been offended by today's video. Tom simply chose that name out of a hat. It could have been Stuart, George, or Tallulah. We welcome everyone from all walks of life here at that finance show, and we will think deeply in the future about examples used. Get lost, Karen. I'm still not loaning you 50 quid. Oh, I forgot about that card. Crested Gecko. <laughs>